So, on observability. Um, this will be a talk more about the, the underlying stuff for observability. We'll also touch observability itself a little bit. Um, most of you know me anyway, so um, we can spare ourselves that part. Let's start with a few, a few definitions. Of course, there's always in tech, you always have tons of buzzwords, which are the new best thing, whatever. So buzzwords very often contain a real kernel of truth, which has actual value, and all the rest is just marketing bullshit. But there is this kernel of truth, and this is what I want to look at. There's also other things. Cargo culting is highly relevant in our field. Um, for those not familiar with the term, that comes from Second World War, where um, a lot of indigenous people in the Pacific Ocean noticed that soldiers were building airports and such, and then planes started coming and dropping off gifts from the gods. So obviously, what would they do? They just started building their own uh, airports and, and bonfires to attract planes. Of course, they didn't really understand what was happening. They just observed that someone was doing, doing something, and they got a certain result. They wanted to copy that result. So it just did what was apparent to them. And this happens way too often in our industry. Monitoring itself, it used to be a buzzword. Uh, and way too often, it just focuses on, on really grabbing any and all data. So you can just say, hey, I, I have data. I have monitoring. I'm doing things. And those things are hopefully good. Um, for those familiar with the term data lake, um, it's basically a, a huge amount of data which is not structured, not not selectable in any meaningful way, and you have to dig into it by hand or hopefully with automation every single time you want to extract any insights. So and this is something you should avoid. You, you shouldn't just heap data upon data and, and think about what to do with the data later. It's good to have additional data, but there should be some sort of concept of how to use that data and not just put it into your data storage and, and wait for things to happen. Observability itself basically builds on that concept of monitoring in as much as it makes it able for, for both you as a human and for the machines which you're using to discern and understand the state of whatever you're looking at. So it's basically, it's, it's based on the same principles, just the focus of that term, of that buzzword, is a little bit different. So now we've got defined observability. That was my talk. Thank you very much. Um, no, what will we be learning from this talk? We'll uh, recap a few baselines of monitoring. We'll look at types of monitoring data and when and how to use them. What complexity is. A little bit about services or a lot about services. And then bring this all together with, uh, with a short recap and also with a few concepts which you can, which you can hopefully use for, for whatever you're doing, mostly networks, I guess. So. There is this, this pyramid, which is in the Airsir ebook by Google, um, where monitoring is underlying everything else. And I, I highly agree with that picture. Of course, monitoring is the underlying thing for everything in what you do in IT. OK, you need power, blah, blah, blah. But other than that, you need monitoring to actually be able to observe those systems. Of course, else you'll be blind. And hope is not a strategy. Just because things worked in the past, you can't really tell that they will keep working even if the system is unchanged, even if you don't have more customers or new services or whatever. Even in a largely static system, just because it worked yesterday doesn't mean it will work tomorrow. So whatever you're doing, you can't just say, okay, it worked before, it'll work. You actually have to put thought into that system. And this cargo culting, this equals hope at a very basic level. So just doing something because someone else does it and just copying it and saying, OK, this is what other people do, so that's what I'm going to do. That is not what, lead you to, uh, what will lead you to any sort of success or any, any sort of meaningful data. Most of you will have been exposed to ISO 9001 or 27001. Um, those are, in theory, useful tools. Those are useful means to define processes for working on IT systems and other stuff. Yet, if you actually look in your company, if you're certified under any of those standards, you will probably hate them because they're just extra work and they don't actually make your job easier. While their intention 
is to make your job easier and is to, to make things more smooth, to make them repeatable, to make them scalable. But that's not what actually happens. And this is exactly, of course, this is basically coming from a different field and, and it's forced upon you. You can see better how, how people just copying and just implementing things without really understanding what is the intention of it is a bad thing when it's happening to you. That's a lot easier to see when, when you're doing it yourself. So we need to look at why we are doing things and how we are doing things and how to improve this again and again and again. So coming to the, the types of monitoring, there is roughly two types. There is metrics and there is events. One documents changes over time and the other documents specific points in time or events which is term. Um, metrics are usually numerical data. You can have them just as a counter, interface counter or something. This just goes up. It might reset to zero at some point and then it goes up again. You have gauges which go up and down, for example, temperatures. You have Boolean values, shits on fire, yes or no. There's also a gauge. It's just a special case of a gauge. And same for enums. It's also just a gauge which goes up and down. There's some constraints on it, but it's basically the same. And you have histograms and percentiles. Any request which took later uh, longer than 60 seconds goes in that bucket. I see how many are in that bucket. If this is more than 5%, then my service is bad, blah, 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 blah. So counters and histograms, they lose or compress data, at least most often. Um, this is something to take into account. But there is a very good thing for, for metrics. You can easily handle them at scale. You don't really have, have much more data when, when your services get more customers or something. So that's a really good thing about them. And also you can do pretty good math on them, of course there are already numerics, if your system allows you to do this. So log files, everyone here knows log files. They're mostly text items, unless you're using systemd. Um, they most often come with, with pretty shitty metadata, of course, it's all inlined in the same log line. You don't have clear fields or anything. They scale probably li linearly, which is not a good thing. And you can obviously summarize them into metrics, and you should probably be doing that in your system. So you can get an easy insight into your logs without having to actually look at those logs. Traces in networking, they don't really happen very often unless you're using software-defined stuff but this is coming more and more into our field, so that's good. Um, it basically tells you how to go a code path in your program, in your controller, maybe someday even your switch. So you can actually understand why things are doing some, something in a certain way. They're pretty expensive to run, which is a downside, so usually they are off or just sampled and every 10,000s or whatever execution gets traced and that's what you can look at. And some sort of issues might magically go away when you trace because they are expensive, so they cost extra execution time. So race conditions and such might be hidden when you're actually looking at those. And there is the other form of trace, which is not really a trace and something you want to avoid, dumps. When stuff drives against the wall, hopefully at least you'll get dumps. Again, in the networking space, we are not really there yet, but this is something where we need to go, where we need to get that we really get both traces and dumps of stuff when it breaks. And usually you don't have, have the compiler artifacts of those, so dumps are pretty opaque when, you, when you're forced to look at them. Metrics should usually be the first point of entry in your observability story. You're looking at a service, you're looking at dashboards, you're creating alerts. Most, in most cases, you want to do this alerting based on metrics. Of course, they are a lot easier to handle, and they are just, yeah, they're just easy to work with for everything, for alerts, dashboards, data exploration, for all the things. Logs will usually be the second step. When you already have an idea of how the system as a whole, or whatever system part you are looking at, is behaving based on your analysis of those metrics, you can again then jump into specific events or maybe get an overview of how many events are emitting from one particular machine, one particular service, whatever. It's also highly useful for establishing the order of events, so you should have good time, but that's in the network anyway. 
And for, for access control, due diligence, legal reasons, you really, really want to have logs, because this is basically what, what saves yourself when the lawyers are coming. Traces and dumps are somewhere even beyond that, where you can go deeper into the system. So to talk about complexity for a bit, there is basically two types of complexity. There is the one which people just tend to heap on things, because it's cool to have a few uh, full ELK stack, or you need Hadoop and HBase course reasons. Um, you must have 10,000 VRFs on your systems, whatever, unless you actually need them, and unless you have good design underlying this complexity, you can probably get a, get. What? Oh, okay. uh, you can probably get rid of. <laughs> Sorry, that was unexpected. Um, <laughs> Uh, you can get rid of that complexity, hopefully. And there's also system inherent complexity. If you want to transmit a packet, there is certain stuff on layer one. There is certain stuff which the various CPUs and ASICs have to do. There is power which needs to go into the system. It needs to be distributed nicely. Blah, 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 blah. So there is a ton of complexity which is in the system and which you cannot get rid of. But what you can do is, all this fake stuff, get rid of it the real system inherent complexity you can contain. You can compartialize and contain this complexity and make it more manageable to humans. You don't have this huge spider web of spaghettis, which, which uh, is one big dependency. You have clean boundaries. That's what you want to have. Yeah, that I already said. So jumping from complexity to services. A service in my definition, is anything anyone else or yourself are relying on. It might be your customer, it might be a different team, it might be your coworker, it might be yourself. You might have 10 services which you're providing to yourself, but it's important to think of those little packages of complexity as, as distinct packages. So those delineations between services, this has many, 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 many names. You can call them interface, you can call them API, you can call them contract, you can call them something else. I like to call them contract for a very, very simple reason, which we'll come to in a second. So when you have all those services, they build on top of each other. You have a little bit of network, you have some machines, you have some demons, and this is your Apache server or whatever. So there is a service network, there is a service called machine or whatever, there is a service called Nginx. And all those services built on top of each other, either as, as a tree, a graph or whatever. So visualize this mental model of having those services depending on each other. Of course, this, this tower of complexities of services this can topple easily if you just remove or change the underlying building blocks. And this is why I like this term contract. Of course, contract implies a firm commitment to leave things as is, unless you have informed consent of all involved parties to change something. Of course, especially in networking, there is another word for, for those service delineations, for those service boundaries, layers. And now, Imagine someone would just change how IP works and what impact that would have on the whole networking stack. So, yes, someone might come up with weird ideas. And I hope it'll, it'll be a fad and it'll go away. IPv4 is more than enough. We just need more NAT. But anyway, um, changing integral parts of those contracts, of those layers, actually are very costly across the ecosystem. And with IP, it's easy to understand why that is the case. But some random API for some random tool you wrote 10 months ago or five years ago, that is basically the same thing. You also have your service boundaries and you also have people relying on those service boundaries. So you have to take that into account. So why do we agree that this layering makes sense? Everyone in here will agree that ISO layers make sense. Because at the very basic level, we already know this. 
we already internalized as small children that it makes sense to have compartments of this complexity, of this handover. I give you money, you give me a loaf of bread, whatever. This is all really, really built into our whole society on so many different levels. So we don't even think about this, but we should be thinking about this. Because if we design our systems in this way, it makes it easier to observe and to handle them. Very good example, CPUs. Who here knows how to design and build a CPU? Like, really? Modern one or just 30-year-old university course? Okay. 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 So we have 240 registrations. I think one person raised their hand. So um, CPUs are extremely, extremely complicated machines. And many things could go wrong, and many things actually do go wrong, for example, Spectre and Meltdown. Yet we are pretty, pretty happy to just accept that there is this magic service boundary, and we just build on top of it. We have our Linux kernel, or Windows, or Mac, or whatever, and this just encompasses that other thing. And then we build on top of that, and on top of that, and we don't even think about that. This is a service boundary where other people had to decide for themselves, OK, this is getting way too complicated. Um, the light thingy went off, Moritz. Screen got out. Um, so yeah, yeah these, these handovers, or I'm um, sorry, resetting, handling this complexity and just making a package and relying on others to do this properly, that is what we do all the time anyway. And this is what we should be designing into our own, into our own systems. So now we're getting to the actual topic of this talk. Of course, all of, all of the before was just to give you context to really think about what, what you want to do on your path to do observability. There is this thing about relevance. Your customer does not care about your routers being up. They don't care about what BGP settings you have. They don't care about any database being up. They care about their service being up. Whatever breaks in the background doesn't matter to them as long as the service is working. They might have an academic interest, they might have interest for SLA or contract reasons, blah, 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 blah. But what they really care about is the service boundaries and that those services which you define together, that those work. Um, also recap from a former talk, if you have SLIs, as in service level indicators, which you define for your services, to attach to your services. Your baseline service, for example, network, has primary SLA, SLA, SLIs, which you can alert on, which you can, which you can look at. Those automatically become secondary SLIs of the, of the services which are sitting on top and consuming those services. Of course, they become an integral part of debugging whatever is sitting on top. And as this can't be said often enough, anything which is customer impacting or will be customer impacting soon must be an alert, period, no discussion. Also makes definition of alerts a lot easier if you heed that. Of course, you, like classical monitoring is you just do m alerting on whatever, maybe on single machines or something that's useful to a certain extent, but you must always also alert on those service boundaries. Of course, this is what people are paying for, or you being paid for to give to another team or whatever. And again, this complexity to contain it, those service delineations are the perfect containers for this complexity because this is already a good compartment for complexity. So bringing all this together, wrapping it up a little, I really like that quote, that monitoring tells you if a system is working but observability actually enables you to ask that system why it's not working, or why is it working, or how long will it continue to work, how long will it continue to work given the same rise in customer requests which you are currently seeing. Those questions need answers with good engineering, and if you have proper observability, you can actually ask those questions of your systems, and that is what you want to do. But this is not something you ever achieve and you're done and you go home and you have a party. This is something you always have to improve upon. 
of course, there is always something which you, can, which you can do more or differently, and you always refine. You see something new, you have a new service, you have a different outage, you always build on this. So this talk is not so much about telling you specifically do that one thing and everything is fine and you have that buzzword and you can tick the check mark and, and your boss will be happy. It's about enabling you to think about why is, how is all this interconnected and how to go through this to get to that observability thing. That being said, there are, of course, several best practices. Everything where you have a customer impact or something, a large impact at, at your own whatever, without the customer noticing, you should always be doing a post-mortem. And you should always be very clear about what went wrong, in what order, who did something wrong, not to assign blame, but just to be explicit and clear about what went wrong so you can go to those people and ask them what did you do specifically, in what order, blah, blah, blah. And those postmortems are great. An outage is great. Of course, this is a chance to learn about your system. Of course, it did things which it shouldn't do. So by definition, this is something you, could learn, you can learn from. So you can review your service level indicators, your objectives, your agreements. Are those still useful? Would I have been quicker if I had different sets of data, more data, maybe less data, maybe better compressed data? Maybe you can even kill some of that data and not have it be noise in the background while you're looking for the true stuff. Also, those service comp or those complexity compartments make it really, really easy in your debugging tools to, to transcend those boundaries. If you have something which goes wrong, you need to really quickly jump into the underlying services to see those relevant errors. And also, if there's something really big happening in one of those underlying services, you should already be surfacing this to the other, to the other dashboards, to the other alerts. Of course, these are already indicators that something big will happen with the uh, depending services later. You should, where possible, and this is really bad for us networkers, you should stop relying on black box data. Black box data is when you look at stuff from the outside. Does it ping? Yes or no. Is there a BGP session? Yes or no. These are indicators from the outside of the system. They are useful, and you can tell if something works. But ideally, you should have cleanly instrumented code where you actually extract this data directly from, from the code and where people can put in markers, OK, this is something if you run through that code path, thing you went off again, um, that, you, that you actually make those things observable. Every time you're in a function or somewhere where you think, hmm, maybe it's better to book a, put a debug statement, always put a counter. Counters are really cheap. And just let it run for a day, a week, a year, and see if that data is useful. Just think about, OK, Wherever would I put a debug statement, just toss counters, because they're really, really cheap. And in networking space, it's bad, but basically we have to beg the vendors or force them by conditional POs. And you're hopefully the people who know best how your services work. So you sh should have those user stories for yourself. How is your debugging story built up? How can you go? through the critical path of your services to get insight into your service to get to a working result more quickly. Can you automate parts of those paths through your debugging story? If yes, is it worth doing that or are you not doing it often enough? What can you automate more? Does it make sense to make new compartments of complexity or maybe kill old ones and make a larger service to have better containers for your, uh, for your properties or for your, for, your, um, for your service boundaries. And something which I like to do, if possible, I like to find someone, ideally five-year-old, but you can take pretty much anyone, and explain to them how your system works, how your service works, and what are the integral parts of those service. Of course, this will show you what is actually the most important stuff in your services. And obviously, I'm now talking about Prometheus. If you're starting to collect tons and tons and tons of more data, you have more to work with, and that's a good thing. If and only if you avoid this trap of data lakes and you actually put proper metadata on them when you ingest that data. Of course, else it'll just be 
random stuff lying around, which you don't want to. But your tools also must be able to handle this load. And even more importantly, once you're able to handle this load on CPU or I.O. or whatever level, your tools must enable you to actually go into that data, handle this data at scale, look at it, make meaningful deductions from that data. Of course, again, this is the difference between monitoring and just collecting everything or anything and actually having something to go through your data and arriving at working services. Thank you. <laughs>